because if we can do justice for people who are supposed to be invisible, then we certainly will have justice for everyone. It's something that will resonate through the whole society. So today we have distinguished speakers and people of soul and heart who are trying to do the right thing from SEIU and Acorn Ottawa and representing janitors in Ottawa say, says they're barely making enough to get by. So it's calling on the federal government to boost their wages and give them benefits. The union is stepping up efforts in time for crucial contract negotiations. Wabishik Rice has more. To try to make ends meet, Remy Gapas works two part-time jobs on top of her full-time job as a janitor. That's because the cleaning wage alone can't support her family of four. Honestly, it's not really enough. The twelve dollars per hour, it's not really enough for a family to raise a family. The union representing janitors in Ottawa says, unfortunately, that's a common story. So the Service Employees International Union is calling on the federal government to legislate a living wage policy for janitors that would pay them $15 an hour plus medical benefits. Well, the federal government is certainly in a position to set standards, that's what they do. And what they're doing with that position is uh, creating a race to the bottom for cleaners. And that obviously needs to stop. The union counts around 3,000 private sector cleaners who work in both privately and publicly owned properties in the city of Ottawa. As it works now, property managers, including federal government's departments, award cleaning contracts to janitorial companies through a bidding process. The union says the lowest bid often wins, which results in low pay for cleaners. So it believes the federal government must amend what's called the Janitorial Services National Strategy to keep that from happening. We're asking for a living wage and, um, and for benefits, but when the government says that they will only and always take the lowest bidder to uh, award contracts to the lowest bidder, it's, it's very hard to, to get ahead. Until that happens, Gaba says she has no choice but to keep working three jobs. So tiring, but what can I do? We need to, you know, we need to live, survive. The collective bargaining agreement between the union and 15 janitorial companies that service federal government buildings expires at the end of the month. Wabgija Grice, CBC News, Ottawa. So, our first speaker today is a person who is one of your own, one of our own people. She's Lynn Shard. She's a member of SEIU Local 2 and sits on the Justice for Janitors Council and Bargaining Committee. She's a strong single mother who is constantly seeking overtime hours in order to make sure her teenage daughter gets the same opportunity as others her age. You won't believe she has a teenage daughter. She works full-time at the city-owned water purification plant and starts her day at 6 a.m. Lynn is very concerned about how low wages affect childhood development and understands firsthand the real struggles of low-wage cleaners in Ottawa. Please welcome Lynn Giard. I was thinking of, of all of us, 
working so hard. Everybody has to make decisions or choices. The choices we have to make is, do I buy food or bus ticket to get to work? Do I go to work sick because I can't afford a day without sick leave, without pay, sick leave being paid? Do I have to work two or three jobs to make sense me? This is why we here. We are here today to make sure that we're able to to make ends meet. We want to wear, we want to raise awareness. We're demanding fifteen dollars an hour with extended benefits. So this is why we are here today to stop the race to the bottom to address the living wages and benefit issues demanding changes to the policy. There is a simple solution, invisible no more. This is an important event today. The federal government is the largest single property owner in the city of Ottawa and is in a, is in, in a position to set standard, standard working condition for cleaners in the city. What they have choose to do is to create a race to the bottom. In Coast Vavreau, out of approximately 3,000 cleaners in the city of Ottawa who are amongst thousands of working families living in the poverty line, those one-third cleaners work in federally owned buildings, offices, warehouse, museum. Most of them at $11.50 an hour and no medical benefits. That's why we're here today. And first of all, no more. We are demanding the federal government to introduce a living wage policy which pays workers contracted in federally owned buildings $15 an hour plus medical benefits. $15 an hour! How is the federal government creating a race to the bottom? Well, the conservative policies drag down standards and they keep workers trapped in poverty. The issue are the policies contained in the janitorial service national strategy prepared by Public Works Government Services Canada in 2011. The documents provide Public Works and Government Services Canada's contracting authority guidelines for awarding janitorial contract at federally owned properties. The most problematic element of the government of policy includes, and this affects all of us, awarding contracts to the lowest bidder, no effective provision to exclude labor laws violators from winning contracts, no provision for the cost of living, no provision for minimum wages, the conservative policy results in a systematic downward pressure on working condition in an industry where wages are already well below the poverty line. Workers lack extended health benefits and employment standard violation is a commonplace. In this environment, companies are always seeking loophole in an effort to underbid their competitor and win, and win cleaning contracts. This leads companies to search for loophole even more every time. These schemes regularly deny workers basic protection, such as the WSIB vacation pay, holiday pay, CPP protection, or contribution, I mean, and often minimum wage. The solution? We have one. In addition to living wage and benefits, the federal government should change the approach in the janitorial industry to begin providing a pathway out of poverty for cleaners in Ottawa, for all of us. <laughs> they should eliminate policies that create downward pressure on standards and replace them with policies which are fair to workers, fair to us, rewards law-abiding janitorial companies and, and respectful taxpayers. The role of the government is to improve our lives, the life of the citizen, not to exasperate poverty. Invisible no more, invisible no more.
very much here. Invisible no more. That sounds good to me. The next speaker is Trish Hennessy. She's with the CP CCPA. Trish Hennessy is the founder, direct founding director of the New Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives, Ontario Office. The founding director of CCPA's national project examining income equality in Canada, which began in 2006, and is an ongoing contributor to the growing GAP team. Trish is a former newspaper journalist. She has a BA in sociology from Queen's University, a BSW from Carleton University, and an MA in sociology from OISE University of Toronto. Please welcome Trish Hennessy. Nice to see such a packed room and supportive this. For those of you in this room who are earning between $11 and $15 an hour, you are actually part of a growing uh, precarious workforce in Ontario. We just released a report last week that showed in Ontario since 1997, uh, low wage, the percentage of low wage workers skyrocketed by 94%. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, since 1997. For those of you who are who are getting paid low wages to clean the buildings in this community, I know the work that you do is often a thankless job, uh, but I know that the work that you do contributes to the health and well-being of our community, and I want to thank you for that. You are invisible no more. Because what you're doing is you're joining a growing wave of communities who are sparking a conversation about low-paying work uh, by talking about what it really takes to make ends meet. And that's the conversation that a living wage can help create. Uh, we, we opened up our Ontario-focused CCPA office in Toronto three years ago. Since then, the number one hottest research file that we've been working on is helping communities across Ontario calculate what a living wage is in their community. Uh, and we were inspired by, by this growing movement in BC. In BC, the, the uh, city of New Westminster, BC, uh, has adopted a resolution to become a living wage employer in that community. Uh, in Vancouver, Van City, which is one of the largest credit unions uh, in Vancouver, they've committed to become a living wage employer and they're also a champion of the living wage across Canada, trying to convince other employers uh, to, to set a higher standard for their lowest paid workers. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got a call from a credit union in Waterloo uh, and that credit union said, we want to become a living wage employer, but we, we only know what the minimum wage is in Ontario. We don't know what the local living wage is. So we help them calculate uh, what a living wage is. And we worked with a local living wage round table in Waterloo. Not only have they launched a living wage campaign, but they're also starting uh, an, employer, an employer recognition program. And they're getting a number of even small businesses signing up as living wage employers because, because they know that customers want to reward that sort of value. The Hamilton Public School Board has become a living wage employer. Uh, and the city of Hamilton is now looking at how to implement living wage uh, policies through their fair wage policy so that when they contract out, they know that um, when they're giving it to the lowest bidder, it's not that they're condoning working poverty. In Thunder Bay, I was just in Thunder Bay uh, about a month ago, uh, and there the city of Thunder Bay is using uh, our, our calculations of the living wage there to use it to, set, to measure their progress on poverty reduction in that community. This is a growing conversation. Uh, a year ago, I was in Guelph, and it was a packed room like this, and it was filled with community leaders, including the chief of police, who said, I understand the value of a living wage. That's part of what we need to have a healthy, functioning community. Uh, in Windsor, in Windsor, they started a living wage campaign. The Windsor Chamber of Commerce has signed on and endorsed that campaign. So the conversation about low pay is changing rapidly in our province. Uh, in Toronto, we just released a report about the living wage when 
takes to earn a living wage in Toronto. Um, and we had a community there um, ask us to do that, to update the living wage to 2015, because they wanted to pay all of their GTA uh, branches a living wage, and they're also uh, committed to bring on more credit unions, more employers they are going to champion a living wage as well. Uh, so the conversation is definitely shifting. By the end of this year, our office will have helped 15 communities in Ontario uh, determine what their local living wage is. And thanks to the uh, support by the Atkinson Foundation, we're also working with Tom Cooper, who has been a leader uh, on the living wage file in Hamilton for many years. And we're creating an Ontario Living Wage Network because we know that there, there are these initiatives happening throughout the province. And this network will bring us all together so that we can share what we're doing. So, uh, so the, these initiatives are spreading like wildfire and we want to help amplify those initiatives. Ottawa, your time is coming. Our office is happy to work with the local community here to help calculate what a living wage in, Ontario, in Ottawa would be in 2015, but I can tell you, everywhere we calculate what the living wage is, it's way higher than the minimum wage. It's way higher. And that living wage conversation helps to reveal the inadequacy of the minimum wage. It helps to reveal why our labor laws, provincially and federally, need to be modernized to reflect the reality of growing low-wage precarious work and to stop that race to the bottom. Uh, it's why there's a growing movement for a $15 minimum wage uh, uh, campaign going, uh, going throughout Ontario, and, and that conversation is spreading across Canada as well. Uh, and, and the other thing that the living wage uh, conversation can do that I really like is it can help inform the argument that you always get whenever a province decides that it's going to raise its minimum wage. You have small business, you have the business lobbyists saying, ah, small business can't afford uh, to raise the minimum wage, and you're going to you're going to kill jobs. Well, I work with a team of economists, and we review the the impact of minimum wage increases in Canada between 1983 and two, 20, 2012. And what we found was it had no discernible impact uh, on on job creation or or on uh, the contraction of jobs. Um, that in 90% of our regression models. Uh, it had no discernible effect. Uh, in fact, the bigger thing that impacts uh, job creation is whether your GDP is growing, so whether you're in a recession or not. Um, and meanwhile, there, there's a, a growing business case for employers, public and private, to pay their workers better. It's good for the local economy. You know why? Because low-wage workers do something that rich workers don't. They spend all of their money locally, so you're the invisible white engine of the Also, when you pay workers a higher wage, you grow the tax base. And guess what we do when we grow our tax base? We eliminate deficits that happen during recessions. We are able to invest in public services that benefit everyone, and that's what everyone in this room contributes to. So paying workers a living wage is a form of community wealth building. Um, and, then, and then there are benefits for the employer too. And, and there's some research that looks at Walmart versus Costco in America. So in the US, Costco pays their most paid workers higher, a higher wage um, than the minimum wage, higher wage than Walmart pays. Costco also pays their workers better benefit, leave, pension, that sort of thing. Um, and guess what? It turns out that it's better for, for Costco's bottom line, that they get um, double the sales output per, per employee um, than Walmart's uh, Sam's Club gets. And, and they also save money because they don't lose as many workers who are desperate to find the best, first available, next best paying job. So they're saving money over Walmart. And there was a new story I just read this week um, where the, the American CEO of Walmart says, you know what, we're actually going to raise our workers' uh, lowest pay to $9 this year to $10 next year, and we're already seeing the benefit from, low, from a higher retention rate, so we're not having to pay to hire new people and train them all, all, all over again. So the conversation is shifting. We can set a higher standard, and it starts with government, because governments 
provincially and federally, they set the tone and condition for labor markets. They determine how high or how low the bar is. So that's what I like about what you're doing today. It's very important. You're helping to change the conversation about what it really takes to make ends meet. And uh, it's great to see that happening in the national capital today. Thank you.
abhor a change to the temporary foreign worker program. Because you know what? This country is built by this country was built by immigrants. So if you're good enough to work, you're good enough to stay. for council. It never occurred to me to 
run for anything because I don't like getting my feelings hurt and uh, I thought that uh, as a elected official that happens sometimes. People will criticize you and uh, they criticize you otherwise but not usually publicly. Um, but you know, it, it occurred to me one day, somebody said to you, why did you decide to run? And it took me it took some time for me to think that through and I'll tell you, in 1984, we had uh, our first and only uh, all leaders debate at the federal level on women's issues. 1984. And the issues that were discussed was Ed Brockman, it was uh, John Turner, and it was Brian Malone. And the issues that were discussed in 1984 quality, affordable childcare, affordable housing, violence against women, pay equity, access to good jobs. 2015. And we are still talking about childcare, affordable housing, violence against women, pay equity, and access to decent jobs. The wrong people are representing you. The wrong people are representing you. At every level of government, the wrong people are making decisions for you. You need to change that. So, you know, last term, ACORN came uh, to the city of Ottawa and asked council for a living wage. And council said, no, not going to do it. We, every, every building, any, any, if you are uh, an office worker or work in any building, including this one, we've got colleagues amongst us, janitors, people who, who work with us, who walk through the hallways with us every day, we say hi, we meet in the washroom. You are our colleagues, and you cannot afford to live decently. It's a shame, and it, it needs to, we need to make sure that, that your stories are told, that you are not, because quite frankly, you're not invisible. We see you all the time, we ignore you. That's what's got to change. So, I come here because I, you know, I'm a politician, so I get political. We, we do have a federal government today that is out of touch with what we want to call this ordinary Canadians, middle class, low people, lower income Canadians. They are out of touch. 2015 budget, we saw what happened. They gave tax. Uh, Tax, costly, costly tax cuts. These things don't go for free to, to, the, well, uh, to the wealthy at the expense of uh, the needs of the majority of, of Canadians. 1.9 uh, or 1.3 uh, children in this country live in poverty. There is no need for it. We've got the money, we've got it at the federal level. We have got it at the provincial level, and we have got it here in our city, the city of Ottawa. We are a rich country, we are a wealthy province, and we are a wealthy city. And we can afford to do better. You have got to put the pressure on us, you've got to keep it on us, and you've got to make sure that we do better.
opposition whip in the New Democratic Party. She was first elected as MP in the 2011 federal election. She served as the president of the PSAC from 2000 to 2006. In 2011 and 2012, up to March, after Jack Layton passed away, she was the, uh, the party leader at that time. She would place the leader uh, between those sides. So I would like to welcome Nicole Tonell. <laughs> But I would like to recognize, thank you for the NDP. Thank you very much. I'm trying not to be too boastful at the same time, but it's my life. When I was with the Alliance, it was my life. I was nominated in 1984 to the Alliance. I was nominated in 2000 to the Alliance, the first woman. I was the first woman. And what you said when you say we stay here, we deserve a job, we stay here. For a simple reason, I didn't want to tell anybody I was a clear coward. Because it was okay to work in public work, it was okay to work on a machine, it was okay to be a janitor as long as you were a woman. As a woman, you could not. The oppression is the context for music and too. J'ai appris à l'intérieur de l'Alliance et pourquoi je me suis présentée à l'Alliance, c'est que je trouvais qu'il y avait une injustice pour les femmes. Les femmes demeuraient dans leur coin, n'avaient pas le droit de revendiquer les jobs plus élevés. They did not have the right to go for their job. So I started in 84, that's why I started. And then, quand j'ai décidé de me présenter à l'Alliance, c'était le dossier de l'équité salariale. On parle même plus d'équité. Équité, c'est en 84. Mais en 80, en 1990, c'était l'équité salariale. Et savez-vous pourquoi on a gagné l'équité salariale? Parce qu'on a mis des visages à côté du nom. We put a face next to the, to the, the word equality. Because most of the women did not have a decent pay, did not have a decent salary, take their retreat. They were my age at the time. They were not able to think about big with it. We said that's the time we have to put a face. On the faut présenter vraiment un face à l'équité salariale. Et c'est demain pour les gars. C'est les portes qu'on détecte. C'est en expliquant notre job. Que quand est la dernière fois, pas peut-être pas pour vous, mais pour ceux-là qui travaillent comme moi, qui ont demandé à la personne qui vient faire le ménage à leur bureau, et comment va ta famille? How did you spend Easter? What did you do? What, what do we have family? Do we have something? We didn't do that. Most of the time we forget. We forget how you do. We are not invisible. You are visible. And you are part of the family. said $15, some of them said, you're crazy. And now, what, what I hear is in other provinces, it's everywhere. It's not crazy, it's just normal. And if you want to keep your employees, you have to pay them. Mm -hmm. And you have to put in the, in the government, as soon as we take power in November, it will be the 19th of October, He will talk on your behalf. We don't have enough people in the house as women, as men to understand what kind of job you have. We need more. So make sure you understand the person, ask the right question. L'équité salariale, en principe, est réglée, mais présentement, le besoin du 15 dollars. On a besoin, c'est un minimum, que vous ayez une retraite décente que vous soyez capable de mettre de la nourriture sur la table à la fin du mois. Et non pas faire les food banks, because you cannot end the month. Because you, you are paying 15, 11, 9, and 10 dollars a month. That's what you have. Tom Malker promised 
that the new government <coughs> will erase the last minimum wage that was at the time based by, done by the labor and in place it will be $15 an hour and we'll show them. That's what I want to see. Today, not tomorrow, not the day of the election. <coughs> I just left the place door to door. And we have problems so, sometimes to recruit the, 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 the volunteer because people believe it's only the day of the election. No, it started. It started in 2011, second of May. And we need volunteers, we need people to help out, and we need to elect and be a government. That's what we need. volunteers that are here today that enjoy their work, that work for 15 hours, and that they are doing that. And I'm really proud to see so many people. Je suis très fière de vous voir et je vous dis, lâchez pas la bataille, vous êtes visible. Tous les jours, vous êtes là. Vous faites le ménage, si on est bien dans vos bureaux, c'est parce que vous êtes là. And we need to recognize that. We need to work with you, and we need you at the same time. If you were not there, if people say, oh, we don't need janitors, what will be our office? What will be a street? We need you. But you need to be paid a decent pay. That's what we need. Thank you very much. Sont avant, sont et 
sont avantagés et font assez pour vivre de la dignité. Ok Je vous dis merci. À partir d'aujourd'hui, nous ne sommes plus invisibles. Thank you very much for attending and have a good weekend.